it's Jessica Honiger, founder of the socially conscious fashion brand, Noonday Collection. And this is the Going Scared podcast, where we cover all things impact, entrepreneurship, and courage. This week begins a brand new series of shows where we dig into what it looks like to begin, to start to make it happen. In this upcoming series, we're gonna be talking with fitness gurus, entrepreneurs, nonprofit founders, and we're even going to talk about how your Enneagram number interacts with this whole idea of starting. I love the quote by Rumi that says, if you start to walk on the way, the way appears. Maybe it's a goal in your life, a business, a nudge that you laid down after the kids came. Whatever it is, we are going to be spending time with people who've taken big leaps so that we can go and do likewise. And our very first guest on this series is the one and only Allie Webb, founder of The Dry Bar. I got my first blowout from The Dry Bar a few years ago and learned more about Allie's story from this year's Inc. Magazine's issue, How I Did It, where Allie was the cover girl, and I was actually one of the featured entrepreneurs right along with her, which was super humbling. So in 2008, Allie began a side business called Straight at Home, which provided in-home blowouts on a referral basis in LA. And when her business and popularity grew, she decided to expand and start and open her very first dry bar. They now have 100 plus locations throughout the US and Canada, and they have a growing product line that is created specifically for the perfect blowout. It's sold through Dry Bar, as well as Sephora, Nordstrom, Ulta, and more. And in 2014, she received the CEW Achiever Award. She's made it to Fortune's 40 Under 40 list, Marie Claire's 16 Most Fascinating Women, Cosmopolitan's 2013 Power List. As you can see, Ali is certainly a starter, but what she started has actually changed the way women think about hair, beauty, and even themselves. And so that's why I'm so excited for you to hear the conversation that I got to have with her. I want to hear the story behind the story of the dry bar before, of course, I'm going to ask you the origin story because we just all love a good origin story. But tell me a little bit more about the story behind the story. I really struggled with my hair and I don't know why (laughs) it was so important to me. But when I was growing up in South Florida, you know, where it's like very humid outside. So if you have, you know, any kind of curl or wave in your hair or any, you're prone to any kind of frizz. I mean, you're basically going out into, you know, moisture rich air. And so my hair was just always the crazy. And I just, it was like unruly. And I just didn't, I I felt like it just like, didn't look good or it didn't look like pretty and polished and, um, you know, presentable and all of that stuff. And, and this is like when I'm a really little kid, I mean, you know, nine, 10 years old. And, I used to beg my mom to blow out my hair, who was not a professional hairstylist by any stretch. But I just, I loved the way my hair looked straight. And I don't know where that came from, but that was, you know, that was what I always wanted. Well, it came from the, I mean, the images of beauty that probably were around at the time. Although I have to say, this is so funny, but my husband and I this weekend were like, it is time that we introduced our kids to Can't Buy Me Love. (laughs) (laughs) So we totally watched Can't Buy Me Love Saturday night, Cindy and Ronnie, and we were kicking it back. And I was funny because as I was reading through your book today, I was like, actually, she was super on, tr- well, I don't know how old you are at all, but I'm like, for that period, like your hair was looking good, actually. But, um, <laughs> but I know at the well, time, it was. It I mean, was- that was the style. I mean, people, you know, wore like curly, you know, big hair and big bangs. Big oh, hair. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I made the best with what I had, but I didn't love it. And I loved, you know, to your point about society, it was like, you know, Cindy Crawford and Christy Brinkley, like, and they, they had, I mean, they had stylists who were straight hair. I don't understand that, but you know, they had stylists that were, you know, blowing their hair out into this, like, you know, perfect, like whipped perfection of bouncy straight hair. And I was like, just very mystified. Like how in the world do they get hair like that? And so I was like, it was this curiosity that was peaked in me very, very young. And, you know, fast forward to, you know, spending countless, countless hours in the bathroom in high school, trying to figure out how to blow up my own hair to, you know, finally after 
trying a couple other careers, but finally, and one being in fashion, but trying decided to go to beauty school in my early twenties. And it was really like the best decision, obviously I for obviously I ever made, but <laughs> at that time in my life, it was, it was a tough decision to make because my parents weren't really, they didn't really, they, they didn't see much of it for me. And they, I think they didn't mm. love the idea of me being in the service industry and they didn't love, like, they didn't think it was going to, you know, th- my parents also are entrepreneurs and they had their own clothing stores. There's like little old lady clothing stores, like, and next, next to their clothing stores was always like a little old lady hair salon. And I think my parents maybe had this like vision in their mind that like, that's what I, <laughs> where I wanted to work. And I was like, no, you know, I'm gonna, I want to go to beauty school. I want to learn how to blow out my own stupid hair. And then yeah. I want to, you know, go to New York and like do fashion shows and editorial and all of that. And that was kind of like my little dream that I, you know, hope to do. But you know, the other thing about it was going to beauty school was like, you know, it was like, I found my people. And I really felt like that. Like, Mm. I felt like I was around all these other people who were also loved hair as much as I did. And it was like, it did not feel like school. It was like so fun. And Mm. I had the best time. And it was like, you know, one of those very like fulfilling moments where I was like, wow, this is really where I'm meant to be. And, you know, and then I, you know, been doing hair professionally really ever since. Okay. So you discovered, these are my people. This is what I love. This is what makes me come alive. And so you were a professional hairstylist for other people and you did editorial in New York for a while. I mean, I didn't really end up ever doing that. I moved to New York city after doing hair for about five years or so in in South Florida, where I was living at the time. And it was like, couldn't get to New York fast enough. And it was my second time actually living in New York. I also moved to New York when I was 18 before beauty school which is a whole other story. But I, you know, I got to New York. I worked for John Sahag, who was a very famous hairdresser in his right. He was kind of the pioneer of dry cutting. And he was like the guy to work for. Mm-hmm. And I walked into that salon with like my leather pants on and was like, I'm, I'm getting this job, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and I did. And, um, and it was like, it was an, another really fantastic experience because he was such and and most people probably listening won't know, but if you're a hairdresser around my age, you know who he is. And he was just this really interesting, very soft spoken, like rock star, like cool guy that you know just was was the coolest thing ever. And anyways, I ended up working for him for a couple of years. And the way their method of cutting hair was, they would flat iron the hair like when you come in and make your hair super duper straight. They cut it and then an assistant in my, in that case, me would wash the hair and then blow it out. Oh, into like really? a much bigger, you, yeah, they, so, dry, they straighten it before the wash. Yeah. And that was kind of like part of their whole technique for cutting. Okay. And I, you know, I really, I never, I really never cut hair in, in that salon. I was always an assistant blow drying hair. And I did that for a long time and I learned a lot, but I, you know, I blew out so many people, even like I would blow out John's girlfriend and that was very pressure filled, but it was all, you know, part of me getting, honing, you know, that skill of blow drying hair. And I got pretty good at it. And anyways, I worked, I worked there for a while. And then I, um, I actually jumped around and decided I didn't want to do hair for a while and, um, ended up meeting my husband, moving back to, moving to South Florida, had a couple of kids and became a stay at home mom in, in Los Angeles. And it was kind of during that time, I, I spent about five years at home with my boys. And then after about five years of staying home, which I thought was going to be it for me, because I was so over the moon about being able to just be a stay at home mom, I just kind of got the itch again to do something for myself. And that's when I started my mobile blow dry business, which is called straight at home. That eventually is really what led me to dry bar because I realized during that operation that I was getting so busy and I didn't have enough, you know, I really didn't have enough of me to go around. The demand was, was, was really piling up. So I went to my brother who's also bald and had no business in the hair industry and said, I want to turn <laughs> my, my little mobile blow dry business into uh, a brick and mortar where instead of me going to them, they come to me. And so that's, you know, that is really how the whole idea got started. And that was like, we started talking about this, I'd say in like 2009. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about those five years, because you seem like a really driven person. I mean, not anyone just decides I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to work for the top hairstylist in town. I'm definitely going to get the job. (laughs) And then you get married. And then it seems like, did you take some of that ambition and were you pouring it into your kids? Like, were you like 
kind of a Pinterest mom and you were like making like a hardcore momming it for those few years or like, yeah, tell me a little bit about it was that. Just, you know, it was it, when my first son Grant was born, I was, you know, so like immersed in the mommy community and I loved it and it was so fun. And, um, and I, I, Grant was like, I took him everywhere. I was like always wearing him and it was just the greatest thing ever. And I did, I loved it so much. And, and then my second son was born, it just got a little bit harder. <laughs> And right. <laughs> I was like, ah, uh, I don't know. I mean, and it wasn't, you know, and it was just like, I found myself in this like, you know, kind of treadmill of, um, you know, going to the park every day, kind of doing the exact same thing every day. And I just didn't feel personally fulfilled. I, of course, I adore my kids. And I think, you know, it's, my, you know, my parents worked and, and owned their own business. And I think it's, it's, it's great that my, my kids see how hard we work, but I, you know, I just got a little, like, I felt like, I didn't have anything for myself and I was giving everything I had, you know, to my kids and my family, which was, which was amazing and very admirable. And I, and anybody who decides to be a stay at home mom, like, you know, I think that's an amazing choice. It just, after five years for me, I just felt like I needed to do something, you know, for myself. And I didn't expect that, you know, I, like I said, I was expecting to like be just like honed in on this. And, and I was thinking I would, right. I wanted to maybe have more than two kids and, but it just, you know, something shifted in me and I decided I, I wanted to like start to do something for myself. And and the mobile business was was a great way to get back out there slowly because I was able to make my own hours. I could say yes or no. I didn't have to answer to anybody. And so it was it was really perfect for the time. And and again at the time I thought like that would be enough. And then I, you know, mm -hmm. then I couldn't help, you know, feeling like there there was this massive hole in the market for a place like dry bar. And I just, I, I mean, I really felt like it was like my duty and I felt like nobody could do it better than I could because, you know, it was just my, my years and years and years of, of, you know, learning how to perfect blowouts, you know, plus the fact that, you know, now there, you know, I had these other partners and people who could help me really bring this thing to life. It was just right. like, it felt so meant to be. And so I, you know, I just, I got kind of that bug to, you know, to get out there and do something again. And, you know, dry bar, the first location was very, it was in the middle of a recession and it was very like, <laughs> we were very unsure if it was going to work. And, you know, I remember my brother right. saying to me, like, why don't you want to do like cuts in color too, or where, where there's more money? And I was like, I just don't want to. I've made the, what I love about this industry is, is the blow drying. And I also, by the way, didn't know if there'd be enough, you know, hairstylists out there who would also like the blow drying, you know, part of, of, of doing hair only. And so er everything about it was a big risk, but there was just something in my gut that was telling me, you know, I think women we'll spend the money on this and it'll become this affordable luxury for women who, you know, at that point didn't have, you know, access to celebrity hairstylists that would come over to their house and not charge them, you know, I mean, charge them upwards of 200, $300. You know, it was like, we made it the price point, right. The experience and the, the decor and the, and the place and the customer service and all that stuff, you know, really amazing. And plus you're getting like this car red carpet ready hair. I just thought like, surely, women would like this and maybe we could make one store work. <laughs> when, and what's interesting is you're saying you, you were antsy to do something for yourself, but ultimately I think really you were wanting to do something for others because I think your fulfillment as a mom came from, you were pouring into these little people and there's right. so much fulfillment from that because ultimately hairstyling is about helping other women. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, you know, when I say I wanted to do something for myself, it's, I, you know, it's like I had, I like, back to your, you know, question about being like driven. And I think I was, I felt this like desire to, to do, to start this business because I felt like it was something that was really missing and that, you know, women or at least women in LA need it. <laughs> and so, you know, that was the reason. Right. But yeah. I mean, I think that I did also kind of think it was a little bit of a vain business and, you know, at least when you get your hair cut and colored, like there's an actual change and like, there's, you know, something actually changes. Right. And I kind of felt like, with just blowouts, like, is this, you know, an incredibly vain business or, you know, I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't really think about it that much. I just, you weren't passionate about that. Well, I was, no, I definitely much. was. I and mean, I was so passionate about hair and blowouts and, and I, the reaction that I was getting from women in my mobile business and how much they, you know, responded. And a lot of them, you know, were referrals and they had never even had a blowout before. And so it was, you know, it was definitely this passion, but I didn't realize the impact it would have when, mm. 
you know, when we first opened and I saw, you know, from the get go, how women would react, obviously on a much larger scale, because I was just doing, you know, a handful of women a day where now we're doing, you know, like 80 to a hundred people a day where, where I say we'd see it over and over again, how the, the, the change and the transition, these women experience. Like, I, I mean, I remember, and I know it sounds so silly, but I remember when we first opened and I would not even recognize women after they were done with their blowout. I was like, where did, where did she come from? Because, you know, it was so hectic and crazy. And I was like, where did that woman come from? Because we were, you know, seeing so many people, but you know, it's because most women walk into dry bar with, you know, their hair in a bun or a hat on and very serious, all business. And then when they're done, there's like this visible pep in their step. They're looking at themselves in every mirror. And there's this like confidence that just exudes from them that that once I realized that I was like, like, we are really onto something. We have captured lightning in a bottle here. Like I, I didn't, I didn't see that as much, you know, I just thought I am a girl who has curly hair and always like wants a blowout. And I have enough other friends who also want to blow out. This is a great idea for a business. I, I don't think I realized quite the impact we would have on women and how women respond to it and how women don't go to a board meeting without a blowout or, you know, an important interview or a date or whatever it is. Well, it's so powerful. I remember when I, we work, you know, in countries around the world and in East Africa in particular, we work with this group of women. And when I first started working with them, I remember their hair was cut really, really close to their heads and they were a little bit, you know, they had just started, they were just getting a a really a dignified job for the first time in their lives. And then I remember visiting them a year later and they had weaves and they had, some of them had like purple (laughs) braids and it was like they had transformed because now their job had enabled them to get their hair done. I mean, it's just, there's something about our hair that brings dignity and confidence and it is powerful. And then of course, what happens in the salon chair? I mean, that's like a whole nother, you know, thing, those conversations and just, you know, so it, I love how it ended up being this thing that really does bring empowerment and beauty to women. So take us back now to how do you transition from straight at home to dry bar? Cause that is a big, well, that was, you know, that process, you know, happened kind of slowly and it was a lot of, you know, f- figuring out a lot of stuff we didn't know. You know, my, my brother put in the, the lion's share of the money, which, which is lucky. You know, I know, I mean, now I know because we've raised so much money, you know, from, you know, institutional money. Um, but it, it, Michael did put in the, the majority of the money and I, we put in what we had, which was very little, but I, you know, that's when I learned the term sweat equity. Which, you know, I was like, oh, I like sweat equity. You know, it was basically like I, I owned half the business and my brother owned half the business. And, um, you know, I was running it and I was in the, in the weeds in the day-to-day operations and he put up the, the majority of the money. And at the time, Michael was also running another company. And then um, Cameron, my husband, was doing, was, an, was working in advertising. And so, um, you know, he, he was the one who was like really created like the brand and the brand identity kind of based on the vision I had for this, which was to be like a bar. I wanted it to be like bright and sunny, but I wanted it to be very clean. And, you know, so between his like creative and branding expertise and my brother, like, um, you know, understanding business and putting the spreadsheets together. And then I was on the phone with the cosmetology board. I feel like every second of my life during that time, trying to figure out what I needed and what I didn't need and getting, you know, towels and getting stylists and figuring it all out. Um, you know, that was, that was kind of what was happening between, you know, straight at home and, and dry bar ultimately opening, you know, it was just like, and and I tell people this a lot cause I, you know, I speak a lot and talk a lot about you know, to other entrepreneurs. And, you know, it's just like, you just have to start and you just have to go and you just have to start making the phone calls and making lists and figuring out all the things that you need and in figuring out what things you're good at, what things your partners are good at and where, you know, how much money you need. I mean, it's just like, there's a gajillion things that you have to do in those, in those, well, there's always a gajillion things that you have to do, but in those early days, there's, you're just doing, you're everything, doing everything and you just, you just have to you plow through it and figure out where you need the help. And so I think that was, you know, that was, that was what we did. You know, we asked a lot of people for help. We asked a lot of people for advice, friends, family, whoever would talk to us to get to where we needed to go. And that's, I think that's the, that's a really important message because I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs who are, you know, in the throes of it and are trying to start a business and they're like, they just feel like there's too much they don't know. So 
right. they're like, I don't know if I can And they do also it. are too afraid to reach out and ask for help. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I find that a lot of people don't actually ask for help yeah. when they need to. Yep. Yeah. It's true. And, you know, and that's, an, that's, and I always tell people like, you'd be really surprised how many people you can leverage in your own personal network. You know, it's like you have a friend who's a lawyer yes. who would just give you some free advice or, you know, there's, there's always somebody totally. I believe willing to help. And, you know, I, I help people, especially my friends as often as I can. Absolutely. Okay. So I want to know if, did you, at what point did you feel risk or did you, I, it's funny. I heard on some NPR episode years ago and they did this study and they were like, entrepreneurs actually aren't any more risk takers than anyone else. They just believe so 100% in their success that it doesn't really feel like risk to them. And it sounds like you kind of were like, this is going to, like, this is going to take, like, this is a hole in the market. Did you feel risk partnering with your brother as far as like, oh my gosh, now I've got a, now I've got money on the line. Now I've got a really you know, monetize this. Yeah. I mean, I think there was, there was, there was fear. It's, it's so funny though, talking about it now because we're, you know, almost nine years in and, you know, knock on wood, so successful and prove the model and all of those things. But when I think back to, right. you know, days before we opened the first shop in Brentwood and how much anxiety I had over it. And I was like, you know, doing the mm. math in my head thinking like, if we can just get you know, five women an hour in for, you know, like I was doing the math to try to figure out like what it would look like to be successful. And I think that there, so there's, there's always going to be fear and anxiety and, and, you know, worry and about the risk, but kind of true to what you said. I think that you, the way I always felt about it was no one was going to die. And I've, I've said it a million times. I always say this because it's how I felt. I felt like it would have really sucked. You know, my brother put a lot of money and into this and it would have been like such a shame if it didn't work, but no one was going to die and everyone would have picked up, picked themselves up and gotten other jobs. And like, we would have moved on with our lives. And I think that's, that's, that's the difference maybe where I don't, I think a lot of people are scared of that. Like, what if it doesn't work? You know, if it doesn't work, I'm going to be out all this money. I wasted all this time and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, but really who cares? Like, you know, you, you, you know, right. it's like, yeah, there's the, you know, you fall down in life and you get back up. And I think that's what I felt like we were all really smart. And I, you know, in the, in the early days, I was really the only one, you know, putting my time on the line. Cameron was still working as advertising agency. Michael was still, you know, managing another business. It wasn't until about a year or so that they came into the company like full throttle. I mean, they were of course really helping me. Right. So, you know, I think you just have to, you do, ha- I think you do have to be slightly risk adverse and not you know, not be so paralyzed by your fear. And if you are, you you just can't do it because you can't focus in that kind of environment. And I just, I just wasn't, I had fear, I had an anxiety, but I wasn't paralyzed by it. Right, right. This is called the Going Scared Podcast. So we're all about just walking (laughs) through your fear, (laughs) just how it's done. People (laughs) want like this magic formula and it's like, you just get up and you go like that's That's the trick. And, and I think there's, you know, it's like, it's like, it has to be hard sometimes. Is, yeah. And then it's, I, I've always felt like that. Like when things are hard, it, you know, you, it, I, I think it means that like the, when it's, there's such a promise of like things getting better. If things are bad, they usually are only going to get better. And, and I, to me, that's always kind of kept me going. Like I might feel bad now or things are hard right now, but I know that there's kind of a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think I'm just, you know, a fairly optimistic person and you know, that's how my mother was. And so I think I, I just inherited that, but I think that a lot of people have a hard time with that, but that's just kind of how I see the world, I guess. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about that. Let's talk about hard because I feel like founders get asked a lot about our origin stories, but then people don't often hear about the 1 million choices after that original start that shape and steward the brand. So can you describe a season over the last few years in particular that have required perseverance and kind of saying, I'm not going to quit? Well, I mean, you know, the, as great as, you know, the, the, the growth of Dry Bar has been, it, it 100% didn't come without a lot of pain points and especially, you know, it, trying to figure it all out in those early years and, you know, having a really good problem on our hands with, with being so busy and having such, you know, kind of immediate success. It, it just kind of like got to the point where we were like, um, this is, this is like so big and we don't totally know how to do this, Mm -hmm. you know, because there was, you know, the the vision of the company and and what I wanted to do, which I, you know, talked about is like, you know, give great hair to women 
as many women as we could and create an amazing experience in dry bar, great customer service, you know, the TVs, all the things. And, but then it's like, all of a sudden we turned around and we had, you know, 300 employees and then we had 500 employees. And it's like, that's a whole other business. You know, we had yeah. to, to start a call center because the, you know, the call volume was so incredibly high. We couldn't answer the, the, the phones in the shops. Like there was a lot of like things that operationally were, were like, uh Oh, we don't know how to do any of that, you know? And so, you know, that, that in and of itself became just kind of a challenge that we had to, to deal with that we didn't know how to do. And, and I think that we're, you know, we're entrepreneurs and I, I, you know, I had this vision of what I wanted, but then, you know, carrying that out and making sure that like people are getting paid and people are happy and all of those things that requires a lot of help. And so, you know, that's when we started to bring in more experienced, like seasoned, executives. And that was kind of hard for me because I really had to um, get comfortable. And this is, I'm sure, something a lot of founders talk talk about. Um, I had to get comfortable with giving up a little bit of control and decision making because I had to bring in other people and I had to, you know, ultimately let them make decisions. And that that was a very long transition that took me, you know, a, a long time to get comfortable with. You know, it was definitely challenging to, you know, to, to take on that like kind of next level of like, well, you know, you, you aren't going to make every decision, but it was a slow, you know, it was a slow build. And, you know, ultimately we ended up bringing in a professional CEO and my brother was CEO before that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it, it definitely happened slowly and I feel like I'm, you know, way evolved on it now, but those were like some really tough years for me, you know, letting go to a certain extent, um, and I really struggled with that. And I, it was a lot of, a lot of <laughs> long conversations and a lot of, for me, like learning and growing how to, and in, like learning how to, you know, how to give feedback and how to not like lose my cool and how to communicate with people in, in the right way. And, and all of those things that you have to learn, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're running a business. So that was a really tough time. And I would say that was like, probably like, maybe from year like three to what are we in almost year like eight now I'd say last like three or four years and I think I've only recently really come out of that and and feel like it really let the teams kind of do their thing and Mm. um, have a much more peripheral view of of what's happening and um you know I weigh I there's some things that I won't let go but I still weigh in on a lot of Mm -hmm. things but let the team you know, really fly. And and that's, and that's really empowering. And that's been, you know, that's been something that I've, that I feel really proud of that I've worked really hard to get to. Yeah. That's incredible. I mean, honestly, that is one of the, my little selfish reasons that I'm like, um, I want to have Ali mentor me on my podcast. (laughs) Um, because I did want to ask you about role. We finally have our executive team is fully set. We're at about 20 million, but we really have dreams and desires to scale pretty quickly over the next couple of years. And as the founder, I am in that pivotal place right now of what is my role? Like, how does my role need to shift now? And I'm curious, how do you decide that where you're most needed in the business? And then how do you measure if you're spending your time in the right places? Because not, you know, founders, not everyone writes a book or starts a podcast or speaks and you seem to really enjoy all of those things. And so how Uh do you sort of evaluate where to spend your time now as your role is shifted? Well, I think, you know, it is, it is determining kind of your highest and best use. And I think that that has, you know, changed and transitioned a little bit here and there. Um, that, that has definitely, um, you know, changed for me. And it's, again, it was a lot of like, you know, really heartfelt conversations with my brother and our CEO, John, who I just absolutely adore. And, you know, there was, it it was, it definitely kind of happened in phases, but I think, you know, when I say highest and best use, you know, I think it really is about figuring out what I actually really like to do and what I'm actually really good at, which may not be one in the same, right? you know, for everybody. But, you know, for me, it's like I did, um, you know, there's, there's like a couple of like kind of sacred cows, right? There's, you know, like product development. We have a massive team on product development and who do the majority of the work, but there is not, there will never be a, as far as far as, as long as I can see, there'll never be a product that gets released into, into the world that I didn't personally, you know, sign off on. And, 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 
part of the development process. I mean, there's a lot of ways that we evaluate products and we send them out into the field and we do lots of different testings and lots of different ways, not on animals or anything, just in case anybody's listening. But, you know, there's, so there's a lot of different ways, but that, you know, but I, I, you know, that's still a very like a sacred thing to me because I obviously have such a deep, sense of hair and, you know, it's where I come from. So, you know, there's things like that. And, you know, I've, I'm obviously the face of the brand and I do all the press and I do all of that kind of stuff, but there are definitely instances now where we have some of our top trainers, you know, go in and do certain things when it comes to press and things like that, which is, which is also an involved kind of thing. Obviously I still do like the majority of it and the big stuff, but And I do all, not all, but I do the majority of like our hair training videos and things like that. The things that, again, I'm good at, you know, I really understand, understand hair from a fundamental level. You know, I understand how to style hair. I mean, I feel like nobody can do it the way I can do it. And and I feel very proud of that. And that's something that, you know, I, I can, I can speak really well on behalf of the brand. I've been doing it for nine years. So there's, there's, those are the things that I've we've all kind of isolated out. And was there a point when you were going through these transition conversations where you kind of had to own that? Like, no, you know what? Like, I am good at this. I'm a specialist in this. And because I know you're kind of trying to think, where can I be replicated, right? And where can I not be replicated? Yeah, 100%. I mean, you know, even though... I, you know, I still obviously weigh in a lot on PR and marketing, you know, you know, we have a CMO and we have a whole team of marketing people. And, you know, a lot of them have been with us for a long time. So they know kind of how I like and want things. Um, but, you know, but you also need a rub there. You need somebody pushing back on I, things that we've been doing for a long time saying, how about we try this, you know? And, and I think that, you know, for the most part, you know, it, it, it's good. And I, I remember even having a conversation with my brother not very long ago when I was very frustrated at something that was going on that one of our teams was doing. And, you know, his response to it was like, you've got to just let them do it. And if it fails, it fails. And then they'll learn. And I was like, you know what? You're right. Because just like we made, we have, of course, we've made mistakes and then you learn from them. And it was like, we have to enable our teams and the people we've put in place to do that too. And I think that was very enlightening for me because I was like, uh, okay, like the world is not going to end. The business is not, not going to fall, fail. And no one's going to die. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because I, I really used to feel that way. I felt like, oh my God, if we didn't do X, Y, and Z, the, it was all over. The business was going to fold. I mean, I really was like that dramatic about it in the early years. You know, it's like when I would walk in a store and it wasn't, you know, up to par and up to standard for me, like I would lose my mind and mm-hmm. I would be so mad and I would be so frustrated. And like, why can't we get this right? Why are we doing this? You know, which I, I learned is like, first I learned that there's no, no such thing as perfect. And, and also I learned that like, you got to coach people and you got to get them to the right place and, and you make improvements. It's like, you just can't do it all, all the time. And so those are, you know, this is like the very evolved me talking, but I was, it was really hard when yeah. I was in the throes of it. And you have to just kind of like make some peace, I think, with the fact that like not everything's always going to be perfect and exactly how you want it. And, you know, you, you pick your battles and all of that. And yeah, no, what does that look like from a process perspective though? Because you still have a say, you still have these areas of the business where, I mean, you're obviously the brand ambassador and do you in enjoy that? Is that a dumb question? I mean, you started a podcast, you wrote a book. I I love it. So you love that part, which I think is a secret sauce too, because I think there's a lot of founders that are like, eh, but I mean, really, I think it adds a lot to the brand. No, I mean, there's, I mean, besides my children, there's nothing in the world I'm prouder of than starting Dry Bar. I mean, I think it's like, I I still like pinch myself that I, I, it's, you know, I feel, I can't even describe how proud I feel that you know, this like little idea of mine has, has turned into what it has. So, oh my gosh, it's yeah. incredible. And I meet people yeah, all the no, time. In- incredibly proud. And I feel like it's like, it put me on the map, you know, it yeah. gave me a voice. It gave me uh, oh, so much opportunity. Like, uh, you know, the things I, I get to do now and the the person I get to be and the fact, I mean, just, the, I mean, the fact that like, I, I mean this with so much humility. I mean, the fact that people want me to come and speak at events and talk about my experience, it's still I still like turn around and be like me, you know, because I feel like I'm, I was such like an underdog, you know, Mm -hmm. I didn't go to college. I don't have like a formal education. I, it was just such a scrappy, like 
you know, <laughs> kid. And it's like, it's funny. It's just, it's really funny to me how much I've learned and how far I've come. And, and yeah, so I would, you know, I wouldn't, none of that would have happened without dry bar and, and also without like my incredible partners and the incredible people around us. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, in terms of like processes, like you asked, I mean, I think that that is something that when you have to bring in really great people who are who know how to insert you or like, cause I'm, that's what I'm curious about. Yeah. They, they understand working in a founder led organization. And of course it's like, it's, it may has, it may have evolved in the last couple of years for me, but with my brother and, you know, with, with me, it's like, there are people and I have found this because we employ a lot of people who are much more comfortable in a very corporate, like, environment. And there's, you know, there's just like not the same kind of emotion, I guess, that there is in a founder led organization. Oh, and family where, too, because you're working with your family, founder right. and family. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, not everybody, again, we have found out is, is, is cut out cut to out be in that. that kind of organization. Like when we brought in John, who's our CEO, he had worked in founder led organizations. He did understand the dynamic of that and, mm-hmm. and how, and this was like a family run business and you have to like, you gotta be, you gotta have like a thick skin and be comfortable being in that environment. And I don't know what it's like to be in that as the, as an outsider, because it's my business, but you know, John really did. And he really understood it. And, and I think every, all the, all of our executive leaders really understand it. I don't think they all always have, but I think we happen to have an exceptional team in place right now. And Mm -hmm. that, you know, and so I think that is part of maybe the process of figuring that out because you, you can very easily come across people, executives who might be amazing, but they're just like, they don't, it's a, just a different dynamic mm-hmm. when you're working for like a, an impassioned founder yes. who's going to throw a monkey wrench in your, in your plans all the time. Right. You have to be okay with that. Like really okay with that. Yeah. And if you're not, it's just not the right place for you because you're- And not even just okay with it, but also acknowledging that that is part of the success. Exactly. That's very true. So I run into people all the time who you have inspired. I was at a at a hairstylist the other day and she was like, oh my God, you're getting to talk to Ali. She has completely changed my life. Aww. So when you hear these stories, like what's one story or a couple stories or sort of a theme that sticks out to you that you were just so proud of that you're like, wow, I've really helped change the world in a way. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a trip. I mean, I I can't believe how many notes I get like that. Like what you just said. I mean, how so many, whether they're budding hairstylists or just, you know, I I just got a note from a girl who said she was a nurse practitioner, but really wanted to go to cosmetology school and had read about me and my story and like was going to do it. And, you know, I get, I get notes like that a lot, or it was just someone in, in a completely different industry who just kind of, you know, had listened to my, how I built this podcast or my podcast, raising the bar, whatever they, they listen or know the story. They, they felt like, again, like if she did it, I can do it kind of mentality. And, Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, and I, it is, it is something I hear and I get via DM and email all the time. And it's, Mm -hmm. and it's, yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I mean, it's, I, it's really mind blowing to me and it's, it's, um, if, I mean, obviously it feels so good and so rewarding that, uh, you know, that I, I inspire people or what I, I've done inspires people or what we, I say what we've done because it's, I certainly did not do it alone, not by a long shot. Well, it seems like you've created a really special culture too. I mean, I've just heard that the culture of your employees and your stylists is really life-giving. Yeah. I mean, we've, you know, we really have tried to create an environment where stylists, you know, feel like they're part of something and they're well taken care of. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't think, you know, I don't think that dry bar is for everybody. It's a very labor intensive job and it's, you know, you, it, it just is, and it's, it's a lot and you're always kind of you're always busy, which is, you know, and to me that I, I thrive in that kind of environment, but then we have found their stylists who prefer to be in a cut and color salon where they can take, you know, 20 minute breaks between clients and things. It's just, that's not how we are. And I think that there's there to your point, I mean, we, we employ almost 3,500 stylists and they, I think they really just, I love to be a part of this brand of like kind of this movement, this thing that we created. And, um, and they're, they're proud, you know, to, to be a part of, of, of dry bar. And that's, that's, yeah. I mean, there's, there's nothing better than that. I mean, I'm so we're, we're all so proud of that. And we do a lot to nurture that, you know, we have these like heart and soul cards that have our 10 core values, which, you know, basically are like, 
you, you know, we are family and like life is too short to work someplace lame and, you know, be yourself and all these things. And then we have these cards that in the stores where stylists can give them to each other and like pin them up on a wall and like kind of say something great that they thought another stylist did or, and you know, it's this kind of gratitude that we give back and, you know, things like that. And then just like silly things, like always making sure there's snacks for our stylists, you know, and mm. buying them lunch sometimes and, you know, whatever it is. I mean, there's, there's definitely this camaraderie at dry bar and the fact that, you know, there's a lot of flexibility. They can work for us and work for a full service salon. They can, they can leave us and go work for a full right. service salon and then come back to us if they're slow at their salon. So there's, you know, there's, there's an incredible amount of flexibility and it, I think it really does feel like a home. Okay. So let's talk a sec about confidence. You know, when you go, think back to the anxiety ridden alley the night before, you know, the Brentwood store opens and the person you are now, what are some things along the way that have helped you to build your confidence legs? Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely wasn't super confident, not the way I am now when we first started. And I think, um, I think it was, you know, first and foremost, seeing th this little idea take off. I mean, that was like, mm -hmm. obviously, as you can imagine, was a ma massive, you know, confidence builder. And seeing the way, you know, women were reacting to what we were doing was like, you, you know, just unbelievable. And I think that that instilled a ton of confidence in me. And, you know, and then seeing how the rest of the world and the press and the stylists and all of that responded to this idea, it was kind of like, a moment for me where I was like, you know, like, wow, look, at, like I'm that that's pretty amazing. Like who knew, you know? And so I think it just mm. kind of, you know, slowly but surely started just instilling a lot more confidence in, in me. And then it was like just the learning process of, of growing this business and learning from other people, you know, learning from a lot of like the executives I've talked about and learning how to navigate a lot of the things that I didn't know in terms and then raising money. And they, you know, there's just like thing after thing that I've learned over the last nine years that have, you know, really, I think rounded me out as a, as a person. And I feel so much smarter and, you know, more just well-versed in the world. And, and I think that that, you know, that kind of happens slowly over, over time. And I, and I think when you, it's like, it's like the old cliche, like knowledge is power. I mean, I do feel like that. I feel like when you're more knowledgeable mm -hmm. about like what you're doing and, um, y you know, how you're growing as a person, it does make you feel like a lot more confidence and, and powerful and, and, you know, the ability to like, you feel like you can kind of conquer the world. So I think that mm -hmm. happened for me, you know, slowly over time, you know, and I think there's, there's something to do with age too. You know, when we started dry bar, I was yeah. around like 30 five, 36, you know? And so mm -hmm. I've been, you know, I've had, I've grown a lot as a person and you, you just kind of, I think when you hit your forties, you start to feel like I got this, you know? All right. So you definitely got some behind the scenes. We've wrapped up our Imperfect Courage series, and now we're really diving into what my role looks like at Noonday Collection. So I took this as an opportunity to ask her some questions that I really appreciated. I hope you appreciated them too. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Um, make sure you go and leave a review on iTunes. I know that I say this on a lot of my episodes, but this is how people find going scared. So if this podcast has meant anything to you, which so many of you have told me it does, just hop on real quick and leave a review. I love what one reviewer said. She said, listening to Jessica is like talking with a girlfriend over a cup of coffee. She shares her own stories in a vulnerable way while celebrating other women every chance she gets. The biggest thing that I've learned from her is that another woman's success does not diminish my own. Thanks for tuning in today. Our wonderful music is by my good friend, Ellie Holcomb. Going Scared is produced by Eddie Kolpholtz, and I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared. Mm -hmm.